Hi, everyone, and welcome to Disrupt Your Day. I am Petula Sankar Singh, your host, and um, I'm super excited about the special edition that we're doing with um, some amazing professional women and telling their stories. This edition is called Breaking Barriers, Amplifying Women's Voices. And today we have the amazing Roshana, I typically just go by the first name, but I'll give you just a small, um, cause her bio is amazing. And then I'll let her <laughs> share her story. <laughs> so, um, so meet Roshana, a trailblazer in the law enforcement, um, arena, joining the Hollandale beach, um, police department in 1999. She made history as the first African-American female, certified police officer in the city. Throughout her 22-year career, she held various leadership roles, earning accolades for her exceptional service. Now, welcome. I'm super excited to have you. And I'm like looking forward. I've been looking forward to this <laughs> for weeks now. So oh. hi, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you for having me on. I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Oh, you're welcome. So law enforcement, tell us your journey. Like, yeah. how did you get into law enforcement? Uh Oh, that's a long story. Um, <laughs> the short version. <laughs> uh, growing up, I never wanted to be a police officer, right? I mm -hmm. never had any desire to become a cop, never wanted to become a cop. There was nobody in my family that was a cop. Mm -hmm. So I just really didn't grow up thinking that I would fall into that career path, right? Mm -hmm. I was actually an actress. So... Uh... elementary school and I went to uh, through performing arts programs mm -hmm. and so it wasn't until um it wasn't until after um college that I kind of stumbled into it because mm -hmm. I had had a kid right mm -hmm. I was a single mother young mm -hmm. 20 years old I was working two jobs uh, a physician's assistant assistant at Barry yeah. University yeah. And then at night I worked at Lord and Taylor um, in Aventura Mall. Oh wow. And, yeah. And so just having two jobs, being a single mother, mm -hmm. it was difficult. Um yeah. I had the help of my parents and my sister, which was really mm -hmm. great, but I wanted something more, right? If that made any sense. And um my goal was to become an FBI um profiler. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I saw Shamar Moore on uh Criminal Minds and I yes. fell in love with him and I fell in love with that show because that show was about profilers. Yes. So, uh, my mom had a cousin who worked for the FBI at the time. So she actually sent me an application and that thing mm -hmm. was like 132 pages. Oh my God. And I was like, I'm not filling that out. Like, right. you know, like that's just too much work. They mm -hmm. want to know like who your babysitter was when you were born. And oh I, my God. I, I just didn't have time for it. So my mother found an article in a newspaper for a community service aid position um, mm -hmm. in the city of Hallandale Beach. I didn't know where Hollandale Beach was. I'm, you know, Dade County girl, city of Miami girl. <laughs> but I decided to, you know, go give it a try. Like, right. If I get my foot in the door then maybe in a year or two, I can trans transition into becoming an FBI profiler, right? <laughs> um, because I have a degree in psychology. So I wanted to kind of utilize um, working for Hallandale Beach to get my foot in the door. And so I went to the interview, I got the job as a CSA and I just never left. <laughs> I, I never left. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> As a mom and a single mom, sometimes you just have to do what you got to do. And well, you never left because maybe there was something that kept you there of interest and you were like, okay, this can, you know, keep my interest for a little bit. Yeah, well, 
So working as a CSA, you like what we did was mm -hmm. we did the car accidents, you know, all of the reports for people who got into car accidents. You know, we wrote parking tickets. We fingerprinted suspects that came when the officers yeah. arrested people, you know, to the jail. And so um, it was a cool job. Like I really enjoyed it, you know, okay. and what one day I'm on a scene and I'm processing a scene for yeah. fingerprints. And I'm literally like bent down on the ground, right? And so there were about four or five police officers just standing there looking at me. So I looked up at them and I was like, okay, they're standing there. They're doing nothing. Yeah. I'm doing all the work, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. How much money do you guys make? Right. I asked them that. And so they told me. And so I was like, wait a minute. I could literally make $10,000 more money to stand around and watch someone else <laughs> process the scene. <laughs> I know this sounds funny, but it was my truth, right? It was my truth right. at the time. And, and I, to be honest, it wasn't about serving people or helping people. It was mm -hmm. about what would be the best path for me to take care of my child? You right. know, how could I benefit in making sure that my child was taken care of in the future, you yeah. know? And so I was looking at benefits package. I was looking at pay. I was looking uh, uh, um, at all of those things because I wanted to make a better life for him. Not yeah. that, you know, we were struggling or anything. That's not yeah. it. But I just wanted to make sure that he was taken care of, you know, should anything happen to me. Yeah. And so there was an opportunity soon after that um, for people who worked for the city of Hallandale mm -hmm. Beach to become a police officer. So whether you okay. worked for public works, whether you worked, you know, for the police department, whether you worked for the parks department, if you had an interest in becoming an officer, you could apply. Oh, okay. um, and I procrastinated, you know, for a while. And yeah. um, one of the sergeants at the time was like, girl, you better, you know, you need to get on this because it's, you're going to have a really great career. And so after much prayer and thought and all of that good stuff, I applied and mm -hmm. just shy of a year of being a community service aide, I did become the first black female police officer for that oh, city. Yay. So tell us, cause you're absolutely a trailblazer, right? The first oh, African American <laughs> female police officer. Yeah. Um, so how was that navigating that terrain with, you know, predominantly male, um, did he, you know, you know, experience any racism? How mm -hmm. did all that work for you? Um, it was difficult, yeah. you know, um, law enforcement in and of itself is a predominantly male driven profession. OK, um, whether, you know, Caucasian, African-American, Hispanic, it's just a male driven career. And so females in particular, mm -hmm. we only make up 13 oh, percent wow. of the population, you know, as mm -hmm. far as gender um, mm -hmm. in law enforcement. And that's a very, very small amount. You know, yeah. um, when I became a police officer in 2000, I did experience some, some things that weren't fun, you know, right. um, some of it was, was racism and some of it was just being a female, you know, people that I necessarily welcome me with open arms, you know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and so I went into this field, not really focusing on my blackness, mm -hmm. if you will. Right. I was more focused on being a female and trying mm -hmm. to prove to the males that I could do it. If that makes any sense. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, yeah. So, okay. So can you share instances where gender presented unique challenges um, in your career? Like, I'm sure, so... <laughs> As women, period, yeah. <laughs> you know, we have challenges, you mm -hmm. know, to begin with in mm -hmm. any field, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. In law enforcement, I couldn't but think that it was, it's more challenging, right? And then mm -hmm. you add another layer to it where we are women of color. <laughs> so, right. you know, right. so then you start with the women, you know, the gender part, then you move into, um, you know, the ethnicity so um how did you 
navigate those obstacles for yourself and you know that you could share with someone that could you know possibly um help them if they're looking um into getting into law enforcement or are actually in it now or in any other field um how would you um share some advice or you know how you navigated that so i checked all the boxes right um um, degrees, you know, um, yeah. of course you see one of them, University of Miami, go Canes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, I checked the minority box. I checked the female box. So I checked all of the boxes. Right. And so mm -hmm. I didn't realize the, um, oh God, what, what should I say? The, the, um, the amount of I don't want to say burden because it was never a burden, mm -hmm. but I did not realize at the time yeah. how mm -hmm. my path was going to impact, how impactful mm. my path was going to be. That's what I'm trying to say. So as a female, right, I was already a young female. I was 23 when I became mm -hmm. a, a police officer. So I'm young, right? Mm -hmm. I already had a child, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm a single mother, you right. know? Um, and so I'm smaller, so I'm not this gigantic, you know, person. I'm five, four petite, you know? Right. So, <laughs> so I'm young and small. So people didn't take me seriously as far as being able to hold my own on, uh, any calls, you know, being able to fight, being able mm. to, you know, de-escalate situations to people. So I yeah. used those talents, right? Um, to be able to make sure that I stayed safe and make sure mm -hmm. that I was able to, you know, come out of each situation mm -hmm. uh, a lot better. So most men, right? They relate yeah. to females as nurturing because yeah. we remind them of their mother, their aunt, their sister, you know, whatever. And so I was able to use that to my advantage because a lot of you know, people listened, you know, to <laughs> me because I, I was yeah. a mother, I am a sister, I am right. a daughter, you know, I'm an aunt. So I was able to navigate my way as a female utilizing those tools. Um, I will say that I had to work harder, um, to prove myself that mm -hmm. I could do it. So for an example, um, I was on a field training and, yeah my field training officer and I witnessed a fight in the middle of Hallandale beach Boulevard and like third Avenue. Right. And before, and I didn't realize this at the time he told me afterwards, but before he even stopped the car, I jumped out and I got into the middle of the tussle. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> trying to be like, this, I'm in. Yeah. Like I was trying to break up this domestic violence fight. Yeah. Right. And so I was tussling and trying to pull him off of her and just, you know, sitting there fighting. And I also didn't realize at the time that my field training officer was just kind of, he was looking at me like, Hmm. Okay. She's got a little spunk. You know what I'm saying? Now he, he did eventually help me break up the fight, but afterwards when we were talking about it, he goes, man, I didn't think that you had that in you, you know, oh. I didn't think that <laughs> yeah. you were, you were going to be so present in that situation. And, you know, you, you proved to me that you do belong here. Oh, and so that's, that's when I knew, yeah, that's when I knew I was like, okay, I do belong no mm -hmm. matter what people are saying about me, you know, being a female, yeah. being too little, being this and being that, you know, I was just like, man, I can do this. Like I actually proved to somebody that I belong here. And so I just, I use that to my advantage and, you know, um, working undercover, you know, yeah. <laughs> female, you know, um, yeah. that was interesting as well. So I used a lot of my, mm -hmm. you know, femininity to navigate myself in situations that, you know, most people couldn't get into or get into and get away with, if that makes so, sense. So, and I'm just curious, cause I love the whole, you know, FBI undercover stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is there any story you could tell, um, that was, you know, very impactful or like, you know, we, like the audience would love to hear? Um, not necessarily impactful, more like fun. So, um, yeah. my time undercover was probably one of the best, one of the best times of my career. Oh. Um, and so what I loved about it is I got to become a legal prostitute. Like seriously, I was a legal prostitute. So I was like, <laughs> 
Okay, so I get to dress all cute and stuff because yeah. I'm a tomboy by nature, right? Uh -huh. I'm a jeans, t-shirts, sneakers kind of chick, right? Mm -hmm. But I got to dress up in these short skirts and put on makeup and I was like, okay, let me, <laughs> let me see how many guys I can get tonight. Yeah. And it always became a challenge for me to one up myself every time I went and did a prostitution sting, right? <laughs> and so <laughs> on this particular night, right? Yeah. I'm out there doing my thing and this guy walks up to me and of course, you know, we get to talking and we, you know, start settling on prices and, and things to do. And so he ends up, you know, getting arrested. Okay. And so I'm like, all right, you know, next I'm, I'm already thinking of who I'm yeah. getting next, what I'm going to say, da, 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 da. So, um, so most times these men, they don't actually, they're not actually transported to jail. Mm. There's actually, they actually given like a notice to appear ticket and then they show up for court and that's how, you know, um, they get arrested. And so about an hour later, this same dude comes walking down the street, right? So he stops and he's like, man, you got to be careful because the police are out tonight and you didn't see them. I was like, no, I didn't see the police. Like, where are they at? And he's like, I don't know, but man, you know, I just don't want you to, you know, get in trouble or, or get arrested. So I said, okay. So he goes, but you know, in the meantime, can I get the da, 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 da. And now I'm like, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I want this. And I said, okay, but you just told me the police are out. You already got arrested. Are you sure you want to do this? Yes, I'm sure. I asked him like five times. Yeah. So I was like, all right. So I gave the signal and he, now this time he went to jail. <laughs> I'm just, it, it was amazing that I got the same dude twice in one night. You know? Oh my it, God, like. It didn't, it didn't click with him that I was actually the cop, you know. And so, <laughs> oh, that yeah, was a that story. So that, that story followed me throughout my entire career. Like you know, people talked about that for years afterwards. But that oh my like, god, I love it. <laughs> so I know you mentioned thirteen percent um, of law enforcement, yeah, right currently, right, and this mm -hmm. day and age is um, female. How, I mean, have you seen anything within your time there? Because you've had a long career um, in law enforcement of any changing changes in inclusivity, diversity, um, any plans in that? Or is it just? Mm -hmm. um, so two things. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started, there was, I don't really recall anything that, or any program or any organization that was really pushing that narrative, yeah. right? You know, um, I started asking myself because I was like, wait a minute, you know, it wasn't until after I left working undercover mm -hmm. that I started to be okay in my blackness, if mm -hmm. you will, be okay in my femininity mm -hmm. being in law enforcement. And so at the time there was really no organization that I had heard of that was actually trying to push the narrative of making sure that more women came on board. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it wasn't until, um, towards the end of my career with Hallandale beach and going into mm -hmm. my career with the town of Pembroke park. And yeah. eventually with me becoming the chief, you know, there were organizations and there's a national narrative now that is pushing um, having 30% of women in law enforcement by the year 2030. Oh my goodness. And so now I think people are really starting to understand that we're needed, mm -hmm. right? That we're actually needed in law enforcement. And so, you know, a lot of agencies around the country are participating in, in this program. Um, and I do want to say, you know, I spoke at uh, Broward College's uh, yeah. Police Academy a few months ago, mm -hmm. and I have never witnessed this. Like in my Police Academy class, I was the only Black female. Mm -hmm. And so this gradu graduating class that I spoke to, 98% <clears throat> of them were minorities. That's and, of the, and of the 98% of them, 
yeah. like 40% were females. And it was mind boggling. And I mm. felt so proud yeah. that number one, I was able, I was chosen to speak to this particular class. And I witnessed this particular class of just the diverse, the, the minor, it was just beautiful to me. And when I left, I cried because I was like, this, this had, I thought that, mm -hmm. you know, people was, people said, you know, you, you had a great speech and you were so impactful. Yeah. And I thought that I was going to do something for them, but little did they know they did something for me. Oh, that, you know? oh my God. That so definitely it was, it was chills through my, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. And now so, to see even, even at Broward <laughs> College, um, mm -hmm. and I hope that I can say this, but Dean Boulier is such an amazing, amazing person in that he understands, you know, um, the necessity <laughs> for diversity yeah. and inclusion. And so he actually invited me a couple of years ago to speak to all of the females mm -hmm. from the um, police academies at that time. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to just speak to a class of females Yay. entering into law enforcement was also gratifying because I didn't have that. You know, I didn't have right. that, you know, when I got into my career and I wish that I, I wish that I did, because I think that I would have been able to handle a lot of the negative things better. Mm -hmm. um, it had, I had someone, you know, yeah. like that to, to talk to. Yeah. I couldn't imagine life go, going through life without mentoring, you know, like even to this day, I'm like, I crave that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I feel the same way. Like when I first moved to the United States, I was like lost. <laughs> I was like, you know, I didn't know where to go, how to navigate anything. So that very much resonates and I'm sure it'll resonate with a lot of people. So tell me what's next. I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right now, I'm just kind of enjoying um, <laughs> being out of law for just re enjoying the fact that I've had a successful career at yeah. two agencies. I was able to navigate um, ending this first phase of my journey healthy, you know, injury, you know, without any yeah. you know, injuries and you know, um, mm. mental health is such a great, a big thing, you know, so I have my wits mm. about me. I'm still, you know, have all of my faculties. Um, so I'm really, really blessed in that. Mm. Able to look back and say 24 year law enforcement career. Um, right now I'm kind of itching at, um, getting back into my theatrical journey, you know, oh my God. Um, I do, yeah, I do voiceover work now. Um, and so I'm trying to expand, you know, what I'm going to do in that, in that field. I've been asked to, um, engage in some public speaking gigs, which I find very daunting because I'm an introvert by nature. <laughs> um, but you know, a lot of people have told me that I have a great story, um, yes. um to share with people. So I'm, I want to look into doing that too. Um, and I want to travel more and just spend time with my family. Oh, that's so amazing. I love yeah. it. I love it. I love your journey um, through it all. And, you know, I mean, incredible. Um, like I call you a trailblazer just in everything oh. that you've done. Um, and I think um, acting would be amazing. <laughs> I know you say you're an introvert, but uh, maybe <laughs> that's sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, um, what what's helped me now is, you know, because I, I was a chief of the town of Pembroke Park. And so I had to stand in front of the dais and present, you know, statistics and stuff yeah. like that. So being able to use that as practice, I guess, you yeah. know, if, if you will, or setting the stage, <laughs> mm -hmm. pun intended, for what's to come, you know, being able to stand in front of people and speak and you know, I think that that's kind of given me some assistance in, you know, my next phase of, of my journey. So, yeah. That's amazing. So before we go, the last thing I'll ask you is, um, I did a project called a love letter, um, for, and I had about 
it turned in actually to a book. <laughs> and oh, wow. uh, yeah, I had 40 mm-hmm. women write a love letter to their younger selves um, mm-hmm. for like a mentoring type program for adolescent girls um, coming up mm-hmm. in today's age and time and, you know, all the what you've learned and that kind of thing. Um, if you, I know I'm kind of putting you in the spot, but <laughs> if it's you okay. could think of something you could share as if you were writing a love letter to your younger self that you mm-hmm. would share with the adolescent girl, teenage girl growing up now on their path, to, um, and their journey to career. And maybe it might be law enforcement. Mm-hmm. Um, don't be afraid to be your authentic self. Mm-hmm. I always judged myself, right? And it was always very negative um, because I was always called the aggressive one, the angry black female. And so I kind of dumbed down myself or or made myself smaller mm. because if I was too grandiose, it would present as being negative to mm. people. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Um and I think it was during the time where the nation was upset because of the George Floyd murder mm. mm-hmm. that I actually said I have to be unapologetically me, oh you know, yes. especially as an, mm. as a black female in mm-hmm. law enforcement, I've got to start finding my voice again. Mm-hmm. I've got to start living in my truth. It's okay to be black and a law enforcement officer. I didn't have to choose sides, yes. you know, it's okay to have a voice to fight for black people. It's okay to have a voice to fight for black females. It's It's okay okay to be a mentor to brown people. It's okay to be, you know, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And so I started to really become my Mm -hmm. authentic self after that and living in my truth. And you see, I have a, I have natural hair and, you know, I do my nails now, you know, like I, <laughs> I, I wanted to, to live my truth because I want, I want to help people. And yeah. in order for me to do that, I need to be truthful to myself first. Uh, I can't go around being shameful of who I am, being shameful of living in my skin, being mm-hmm. afraid of, you know, um, dumbing myself down mm-hmm. or, or people putting me down. If people don't like me, that's their problem. That's not mine. No, it has nothing to do with you. (laughs) Yeah. So I, and I'm still learning that, right? Mm. I'm still learning how to navigate things because there really still are people who will present as that negative person to to you. Um, And so I just have to understand that there's a bigger picture Mm -hmm. for me. You know, there's a bigger journey for me and I have to be free to be authentic as authentic as I can. And that's what I would offer anybody, Mm -hmm. you know, live authentically, live in your truth. Don't be afraid to be judged or, Mm -hmm. you know, what people are going to say about you because they're going to say it anyway. They're going to judge you anyway, you know? So, you know, just take the time and really find out who you are, Mm -hmm. love yourself Mm -hmm. and the universe will reward you for it. Oh, I love it. Thank you for the... Well, thank you so much for joining me today on Disrupt Your Day um, podcast. Uh, This is amazing. I love your story. I can't wait for everyone else to hear it. Um, And um, so audience, please subscribe, share, um, comment, and we'll share details in the description where how you could get in touch with Roshana if you just want to have a conversation, hire her for a speaking gig <laughs> to tell her story, you know, on her new journey. It's been amazing. But one of the biggest things we do at Vision Ready, which is our, the company that supports the structure day, um, mm-hmm. is we promote, you know, be seen, be heard, you know amplify your voice find your voice um and love yourself so i everything you said resonates in so many levels and i know it will with our audience as well 
Thank you so much. I very much appreciate you and we will talk soon. Yes. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Of course. Bye. Thank you.